Over the years, Apple has engineered their software, hardware, and services to work extremely well together, creating a mostly harmonious ecosystem. For instance, casting music and video to your HomePods or Apple TV from your iPhone, iPad, or Mac is such a huge convenience. But did you know there are all kinds of other features that benefit those who have multiple Apple devices? So whether you have one or two or so many that your friends and family may have staged an intervention, I'm gonna show you my top 12 tips and tricks that will allow you to use the Apple ecosystem to its fullest. One Tech Mind. What is up, people? I'm Lance Samosa, the guy with the One Tech Mind, and this is where I help you use Apple and related tech to its absolute fullest. So if you end up learning something from this video, please consider checking out my other ones and hitting that subscribe button for me. Don't worry, it's free. Because I just couldn't live with myself if you miss the next bit of knowledge that I'm gonna drop. Now, just to know, this list of tips and tricks require the use of more than one Apple device for the use cases I will illustrate for you. And they all only use built-in apps, services, and features. In other words, you don't need to download anything special to get started, and along the way, I'll make sure to indicate which devices each feature is applicable to, along with any other special requirements. And a lot of these focus on carrying out tasks in a more efficient way with the devices that you're using. So if you're interested in building those kind of new habits, you can always keep referencing this video in the future to help you get there. So with that out of the way, let's get started with number 12, the universal clipboard. This is a quick and simple one that exemplifies Apple's ecosystem very well right off the bat. If you have ever needed to send a file, photo, or even just a bit of text between your Mac, iPad, or iPhone, you just text it to yourself, right? Wrong, what is this, 2006? There's a better and easier way. As long as you're signed into the same iCloud account on said devices with handoff, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth on, which they are by default. Instead of texting, all you need to do is copy it on the source device, like your iPhone, and paste it on the destination device, like your iPad, just as if they were the same computer. I found that getting singular content from A to B this way is often faster than texting or using AirDrop and whatever you copied will be removed from the universal clipboard after a short period of time or when you copy something new. Number 11, documents in iCloud. If you have a Mac, turning on documents in iCloud will allow you to easily access your desktop and documents folders from your iPhone or iPad by using the Files app. Sounds handy, right? To enable it, open system preferences, go to Apple ID, make sure iCloud Drive is turned on, then click the options button and check the box for desktop and documents folders. Once checked, the contents of these folders will be stored in iCloud and accessible to all your other Apple computers logged into the same iCloud account. There's also an option to optimize your Mac storage, which keeps only recent documents physically on your Mac and older ones readily available in iCloud. This is especially handy if you work between devices like I do. For example, I will often use my iPad as my primary writing device and my Mac to edit photos because of the bigger screen. So if I'm on my iPad and I need that photo I was working on earlier, I can just open up the Files app, navigate to my desktop, and bring it right over with a drag and drop. It also works on iCloud.com if you need to get to your files from someone else's device, even if it's a PC. Just make sure you have adequate iCloud storage or you could end up running out of space pretty quickly depending on how many files you have and how big they are. Number 10, personal hotspot family sharing. This next one is a true gem for my fellow parents out there or if someone in your family has a Wi-Fi only iPad like my daughter does. You see, I don't know if you know, but kids really like YouTube a lot, especially on car trips. So instead of spending money on a cellular iPad and monthly data plan, you could turn on family sharing for your iPhone or cellular iPad's personal hotspot. This allows another device in your iCloud family to use your phone hotspot when Wi-Fi is not available, either automatically or with approval. To enable this, first, make sure you have family sharing set up under your iCloud settings and that any applicable family members are added via their own Apple IDs. Then head on over to your phone settings, personal hotspot, family sharing and flip the toggle and set each family member to either ask for approval or automatic. And if you set it to automatic like I did, it's a blissfully transparent process that quells another backseat request from mommy and daddy. You're welcome. Number nine, airdrop photo sharing. Did you know that there are two key differences between texting someone a photo or video versus sending it to them using airdrop? First, AirDrop is much faster at transferring photos or videos directly rather than texting. 
And when you airdrop a picture or video, it immediately is saved into the recipient's Photos app and potentially synced with their iCloud photo library if they have that feature turned on. And second, when you text someone a photo or video, it will be confined in their Messages app. And they can of course choose to save it to their Photos app from there. I should also note that if you are texting a larger amount of photos, iOS may automatically create a temporary iCloud photo link with which your recipient can then view and download those files to their device for a limited time. So this tip is both about efficiency and awareness of how these two methods differ. When speed is the most important or you're sending documents to another one of your own Apple devices, just use AirDrop. Number eight, control AirPlay speakers with Siri. If you have multiple HomePods or AirPlay speakers, such as my IKEA Symphonisk, which side note is an amazing $100 AirPlay speaker, you likely know that you can control which ones are playing music at any given time using Control Center. But did you also know that you can control which speakers are playing using Siri? For instance, if I already have music playing on my office HomePod that I wanna play on all my AirPlay speakers, I just need to say, hey, play this everywhere. Now playing everywhere. Siri will then play it across all my speakers and I can of course adjust playback with my voice as well. Or if I want to expand music playback to a specific room, I can say, hey, also play this in the living room. And speaker output is expanded only to that HomePod. And lastly, if I've scared my family by suddenly blasting music throughout the house, I can undo all that by saying something like, hey, only play this in the office, which then stops the music elsewhere. These AirPlay speaker commands work on a majority of Apple's devices except Apple Watch, which is a huge bummer because that would make it even more convenient. Coming in at number seven, find your devices using HomePod. So even though we've largely been at home, we still somehow misplace our iPhone and other devices from time to time. It is just a rule of nature, I guess. So instead of using Apple's Find My App on another device, if you have a HomePod, you can just ask Siri to help you out by saying something like, hey, Where's my iPhone? Or, hey, ping my iPad. If your device is connected to the internet, it will start pinging after a few seconds and surely drive you mad until you find it. What's really cool about this on HomePod is that it's context aware depending on who is speaking. As long as you and your family members have recognized my voice turned on in the Home app and Find My is enabled on your devices, of course. So if you have a family with multiple devices, Siri will know you're talking about yours by default. It also means I can locate my daughter's iPad, which is likely buried beneath a mountain of toys by saying, hey, where's my daughter's iPad? And so on. Number six, control smart locks from HomePod. Did you know Siri can control HomeKit compatible smart locks from HomePod? Locking a door, for example, is easy and can be done without confirmation by saying, hey, lock the door. Unlocking is where the ecosystem magic comes into play since you wouldn't want just anyone to be able to shout and unlock your door. So if you ask Siri on HomePod to do this, you'll receive a prompt to validate your identity on iPhone. You'll need to continue on your personal device. Well, I don't use this all the time. It can be handy if you're in a room with a HomePod, but your iPhone is in a different room. It allows you to essentially prime the request so by the time you reach your iPhone and do the face ID or touch ID thing, you'll be good to go and the door will then unlock. Number five, log into apps on Apple TV with your iPhone. Using keyboards on TVs is kind of the worst thing ever. So Apple made it extremely easy to use your iPhone or iPad keyboard when searching or entering account information on Apple TV. And if you have Apple's iCloud keychain feature turned on, which securely stores your login information in iCloud and therefore is accessible by all your devices, Logging into apps on Apple TV is a breeze. First, make sure it's turned on by grabbing your iPhone and going to Settings, iCloud, Keychain, and flipping the switch. After that, anytime you log into a website or an app, your device will offer to store those credentials in iCloud. So when you are prompted for that same app's password on Apple TV, in this case, Netflix, just pick up your iPhone or iPad, tap the Apple TV notification, then your device will automatically suggest the proper credentials for you to log in after a simple tap and face ID or touch ID scan. You can also press this little key icon if you need to get to different stored credentials. This makes it so much easier to log into apps on Apple TV versus typing away. Number four, unlock your Mac with Apple Watch. If you have a Mac and an Apple Watch and you don't have this feature turned on, you just don't know what you're missing. I despise entering passwords. And sure, this sounds like the biggest 
first world problem ever, but I am all about making computers more convenient and removing friction, which is exactly what this feature does. So just let me have this, please. To enable it on your Mac, just go into System Preferences, Security and Privacy, then check the box to use your Apple Watch to unlock apps and your Mac. From then on, if your Apple Watch is unlocked and on your wrist when you wake up your Mac, it will automatically log you in. And if you're worried about privacy and security, good, you should be. But I wouldn't fret about it too much here since your watch needs to be pretty close to your Mac in order for this to work and you'll get a notification for good measure because Snoopers gonna snoop. All right, we're getting into the final three with number three being Sidecar, which is the feature that allows you to turn your iPad into a secondary display for your Mac and gives you so much room for activities. And what's really great about this right off the bat is that it works both wirelessly and over a USB cable with virtually no lag at all. It's pretty awesome. To connect your iPad wirelessly from Mac OS Big Sur, just click the display section in Control Center, followed by the name of your iPad. By default, your iPad will act as a completely separate display with modifier keys on the left-hand side and a digital touch bar, just like the ones on higher-end MacBook Pros, because that's what you want. And of course, you can drag Windows and apps to the iPad just like it's another monitor, but here's a bonus tip. That's right, it's a twofer. You can quickly send an app over to the iPad in full screen mode by hovering over the green full screen button and clicking Move to iPad. Repeat the process again to send it back to your Mac. And there are additional settings in Control Center and Sidecar preferences for the display mode, sidebar, touch bar, and Apple Pencil, so you can customize it just how you want it. Number two, markup documents on your Mac using your iPad or iPhone. Let's come up with a purely hypothetical and say your coworker sends you an error riddled PDF and you just need to go to town with corrections using your handy dandy Apple Pencil. If you've already got the file on your Mac, instead of sending it to the iPad, just select it, tap spacebar, followed by this markup icon, then from the markup dropdown, select your iPad and you will instantly have the document up in markup mode on your iPad with all the appropriate tools. You can then go ahead and make your edits, which also live update right on the Mac. And when you're finished single-handedly saving the project, just hit done on your iPad and your Mac to save all changes. And now we have arrived to the final tip, which is a personal favorite of mine lately that is currently in beta, but coming out very soon to an iPhone and Apple Watch near you. It's the one that allows Apple Watch to unlock your iPhone when you're wearing a mask. Yes, this feature has been an absolute sanity saver when out and about lately. And once iOS 14.5 and watchOS 7.4 are released to the public, you just need to update your devices, go to Face ID settings on your iPhone, and turn on the Unlock with Apple Watch feature. From then on, your Apple Watch will attempt to unlock your iPhone when it's on your wrist and unlocked, and of course, when you're wearing a mask. Right now, it only works from the iPhone lock screen and can't be used to validate an Apple Pay payment or anywhere else you would use Face ID, but you know, fingers crossed. And it works pretty well. It, Apple's still clearly working out the bugs and sometimes it fails, but hopefully the public release is coming soon. So there you have it, 12 tips and tricks for living, working, and playing within the Apple ecosystem. And if you have multiple devices, let me know in the comments below what you like or maybe don't like about the ecosystem itself. It's not all sunshine and roses. Also, I really love hearing about how others use Apple devices and tech in unique ways. And while I just covered a subset of my favorite ecosystem related features, let me know what your favorites are that maybe I didn't cover in this video. Things like shortcuts, automations, more home related stuff. I love to hear what your favorite ecosystem features are. So I hope you learned something new and if you have any questions about the ecosystem or anything Apple related, drop me a comment or hit me up on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Syrinx Starman. And let me know what you all thought of this video while you're at it. Did you enjoy this content? Would you like to see more how-to videos around Apple, kind of like this one, tips and tricks? I'd love to hear what your thoughts are for ideas for this channel. And until next time, thanks for listening to my One Tech Mind. <music>